Now our plan was to use the cosine and then to use the sine. So let's go ahead and use the sine function. By the way, now that we know this number, um, we could use the tangent to find this number. But that's not the way it's conventionally done. Conventionally, we would use the sine instead. So let's stick with that. Sine of 53. So equals opposite side over hypotenuse. Sine of 53 is opposite over hypotenuse. I'm not going to plug in yet. I'm just going to try to solve this equation for the opposite side, because that's what we're trying to figure out. Well, it would help to cross multiply to get rid of the fractions. Uh, that means multiplying diagonally. Well, 1 times the length of the opposite side just gives you the length of the opposite side. And multiplying that diagonally in the other direction gives us the hypotenuse times the sine of 53. The length of the opposite side equals the hypotenuse times the sine of 53. That's what we got when we cross multiplied here. All right, and as I've been discussing in some of the other examples, um, people eventually get to the point where they're so comfortable with this type of problem that they don't start with this equation, they just jump straight to this equation. And we're going to start getting into the habit of doing that as well. We know that the sine of an angle is the length of the opposite side over the length of the hypotenuse. Well, we can solve this for the length of the opposite side by cross-multiplying. If you cross-multiply, you get that the length of the opposite side equals the hypotenuse times the sine of theta. Uh, to save space, I'm just writing O for the opposite side and H for the hypotenuse. I hope you can see this is an O, not a zero. O for the length of the opposite side equals the length of the hypotenuse times the sine of theta. I noticed I should have put a dot here to show that this was a multiplication, just like this is a multiplication. Okay, now again, um, previously we've generally been writing this equation first and then cross-multiplying to get this. Uh, but now we're going to start doing the problems more similarly to how people would do them in real life. We're just going to go straight to these equations. Um, now, uh, because again, um, in these problems, we're always going to be starting with the overall vector, which is going to be the hypotenuse. So we're going to use sine and cosine. We use the sine to find the length of the opposite side, so, and we use the cosine to find the length of the adjacent side, cut. Um, and you do that by just multiplying the hypotenuse times the sine to get the opposite side, and hypotenuse times the cosine to get the adjacent side. So we're going to be going straight to these equations now. But remember, you don't have to do that if the problem is difficult or if you're getting confused. If you're ever in tr any trouble or getting confused or the problem seems different from usual, go back to the original equations. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Now, uh, for the opposite side, we can plug in v sub y. We know that we're going to use v sub y as our symbol for the opposite side. Uh, however, um, should I use v sub y or the magnitude of v sub y? Well, remember that this really means the length of the opposite side. The length of the opposite side. Well, lengths are always positive. Lengths are not signed numbers. They're always positive. So we're really referring here to the magnitude of that component. So we should put in this dot. All right, and I'm not just putting the dot in on the board. I want you to use the, not, to use the dot in your own work as well. Uh, please. All right, so um, then this hypotenuse here is going to be 5. Uh, we know the hypotenuse here is 5 times sine 53. Now we can get out our calculator and do 5 times the sine of 53, which is 4. Again, include the dot. So what number should I put over here? Well, remember that now this symbol does not have a dot. Now we want to put in the sine component. Well, we know that we've chosen up as our positive direction, and the y component is pointing up, so this should be a positive number. Vy equals positive 4. We've chosen up as positive, 
and this direction is up, so this is a positive number, dy is 4. When we write down the magnitude, we don't include a sign, because magnitudes are always positive. But when we actually write down the signs component, we include the sign. Remember that if we put in the dot, we're referring to a magnitude, don't need a sign. If you don't put in the dot, you do need a sign, um, because that's not a magnitude. Of course, we never put a sign in for the overall vector. Overall vectors don't get signs. So we don't need to use a dot here because we don't have two separate concepts for the overall vector. Uh, for the overall vector, all there is is the magnitude. Uh, the direction is already indicated by the angle here, so there's no need to use a dot for this. All right. Well, now we've finally accomplished our goal of seeing how to break a vector into components, or how to resolve a vector into components. Remember, we were originally told that we had a vector uh, of length 5 pointing in a direction 53 degrees above the x-axis, and now we've figured out what its components are. Its x-component is positive 3, and its y-component is positive 4, using the trigonometry that we've talked about before. Now, one thing that we didn't learn about when we talked about the trigonometry was how to deal with the signs. Um, but it's really crucial to be very conscious of signs. This won't be apparent to you if you're just in the very early weeks of your physics course, but one of the most challenging issues for students to deal with in physics is getting the signs right. Well, the first key to that is always thinking about the signs. So one of the main things we're going to be trying to work on here in our examples is not just getting the magnitudes right, but getting the signs right. And an important part of doing that is to have good notation. We need to have two different symbols. One symbol for when we're talking about the signed component, and a different symbol for when we're talking about the magnitude of the component. And again, I'm not writing these dots on the board for my health. I'm writing them here because I'm strongly encouraging you to adopt these and use these in your own work. Even though you won't see your instructor do this for beginning students, using these symbols um, is going to be very helpful to you and save you from a lot of mistakes. All right, so um, in our notation, we're going to have to always decide whether we should use a symbol with a dot or a symbol without a dot. Uh, and remember that if we're talking about a number that could be either positive or negative, we're always going to indicate the sign, even for positive numbers. Please try to adopt those techniques in your own work as well. Um, they're going to save you from a lot of mistakes as you go on to harder and harder problems in physics. So it's very important to develop good habits right now. If this problem gave you any difficulty, um, then you should go back and redo it. And in fact, I'm sure that pretty much nobody probably did this problem using the same notation that I'm recommending, because some of the notation I've kind of invented. Um, so I would actually recommend that pretty much everybody should now go back and redo this problem. Redo the problem even if you got it right, because remember our goal is not just to get the problem right, but to get it right using a systematic notation that will help us on harder problems as well. This was a very easy problem, so this is a good chance to start building a good systematic notation. So please commit yourself to trying to use the same notation that I'm using on the board. Um, and in order to do that, go back and redo the problem. Uh, let me just say one more time again, the notation that I'm using here is not necessary if you don't find this material difficult. Uh, if you find this material easy, then it's not necessary to be so careful with your notation. But if you find this material easy, uh, I'm kind of wondering why you're still watching the videos. Obviously, these videos are intended for people who find this material difficult and who tend to make lots of careless mistakes. Well, I'm using a notation here that should, in the long term, make the material less difficult and also will save you from a lot of careless mistakes. So again, this is notation that's intended for people that are finding this, problem, this material to be difficult. And if you're one of those people, I encourage you to commit yourself to actually trying to solve the problems using the precise same notation that I'm demonstrating on the board.